Dominic Sandbrook is an historian and writer, best known for his books about Britain in the post-war years, from Never Had It So Good to Who Dares Wins. His next venture is a series of four more history books under the banner Adventures in Time, and the first two books, The Six Wives of Henry VIII and The Second World War, have just been published. However, the twist here is that these books are for children. Nicky Gamble spoke to Dominic and asked him to tell us why. The truth is that, I mean, there's quite a good story behind these. So my son is nine years old and um, a year ago he was doing evacuees as his topic at school in year three. And um, we decided to take him to London to the Imperial War Museum because he was really enjoying the evacuees topic, but he wanted to know more about the war. And like a lot of small boys, Mm -hmm. he was very interested in tanks and guns and things of that kind. So off we went to the Imperial War Museum. And at the end, I said to him, "Um, I'll get you a book in a history of the war um, in the shop. And I couldn't quite find what I wanted. So there was horrible histories and there were sort of Osborne or Dorling Kindersley kind of um, illustrated books, but there wasn't really a sort of narrative. There wasn't really a children's equivalent of the books that already exist for adults Mm -hmm. that are kind of rollicking, very readable, page-turning narratives of of the Second World War. And I sort of thought, gosh, that that is odd. Um, But actually there aren't really such things, particularly of, of other episodes in history. I thought there was a bit of a gap. And I sort of had this vague, you know, almost a sort of fantasy. I was sort of daydreaming on the way back with my wife and son saying, you know, you could have a whole series. You could call them Adventures in Time and they could take up different, each one could be a different episode of history. And I idly mentioned this uh, a few days later to my editor and he said, it's a great idea. Why don't you do it? Mm -hmm. And um, so I did. Why did you decide they're not consecutive historical periods that you've chosen, why these four? Well, the, the the sort of most honest answer is I did the Second World War one um, first because that was what um, Arthur, my son, was studying. And so it was in my mind. But also, obviously, the Second World War has become a sort of totemic moment for British national identity. And it's also it's a great story. What you're looking for, I think, when you're writing a, a narrative nonfiction, is you're looking for very strong identifiable characters you're looking for a narrative arc a lot of drama and tension and so on but of course you're you're as a historian you're also looking for ways in which ordinary people intersect with your narrative Mm -hmm. so it's not just the great and the good and I thought the second world was a perfect example of that that I could tell it partly through the the characters that we as adults will all recognize Hitler and Churchill and so on but also through the lives of children caught up in the conflict so you know Japanese girl a Polish girl and Frank a young British airman all these sort of characters um so the second world war was sort of a no-brainer if you like um then once I'd done the second world war uh Penguin said to me well you know it'd be mad not to do the first world war there's so many great stories there too children become aware of that quite quickly because of things like Remembrance Day Mm. and um, the sort of sadness of the trenches and poppies and stuff. So that also seemed like a sort of obvious one. I liked the idea of doing the Six Wives of Henry VIII because I wanted to do something further back in time. I also wanted to do something with very strong female characters. I mean, the Six Wives of Henry VIII, largely we see through the female characters' eyes. Mm. Um, So I really wanted to do that. And then I wanted to do something much further back which is why I did Alexander the Great, because children often love ancient history. They love the kind of myths and legends elements. And the story of Alexander the Great really is this sort of slightly old-fashioned adventure story. So some subjects that children do a lot at primary school, um, and then some that are perhaps slightly less familiar. I mean, that's the sort of aim of the series. I think that's great because there are stories that don't get told because they're not on the curriculum. Yes. So... They are stories rather than historical fiction. Yes, they're not fiction. There's nothing made up. And yet there is imagination and conjecture in there. So where's the line between a historical story, a true story, if you like, and fiction? That's easier to answer than you think, because even as a professional historian, there's always a slight element of conjecture. I mean, as a historian writing about the premiership of Margaret Thatcher or something, there'll be a moment, you know, you, you try to get into people's heads. So, I mean, actually, I I found this much more demanding intellectually to write for children because there was much more an element of trying to think, get into the reader's head and think, what does the reader know? But I was 
I made sure that I would not make up dialogue, that I wouldn't really make up situations. But let's say the beginning of the Six Wives of Henry VIII, we're with Catherine of Aragon as a young girl. Everything about her as a young girl is attested, is from the sources. We travel with her on her ship to England, and we see England through her eyes based on the source materials. We know what people ate, what they look like, what she would, we can tell what she would have thought because we know what she was used to from, from Spain. The act of writing history at all, no matter who you're writing for, involves a degree of artistry. You know, you're fashioning a story out of your sources. But I didn't really, I didn't think that because I was writing for children, that meant I could be more cavalier. And I just sort of felt I should stick to what is, and in, in very, very heavy inverted commas, the truth. Mm-hmm. So, as you say, there's not much dialogue because of that, but there are little bits of yes. speech. And those yes. would be recorded speech, would they, then, from letters or...? Exactly. So when um, Anne Boleyn says she's going to bring down the wrath on Mary, Catherine of Aragon's daughter, these are all quotations from sources. These are reported yeah. Yeah. by, often by... Um, so in the case of the Six Wives of Henry VIII, a lot of what we know actually comes from letters by ambassadors. So there's a character called Shapui, and he writes these very, very detailed letters. Back in there, a lot of them are sort of court gossip. So-and-so said to so-and-so, I heard that this is happening, and that those are the sources that Antonio Fraser and David Starkey and historians Mm -hmm. like that are using when they tell the story of the 16th century. Mm -hmm. And they're the same sources that I used Mm -hmm. telling telling this story. Interesting. Lots of death words as well. Yes. Words from the scaffold. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, I love those scenes. I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, but I love those scenes because they're great drama. Those sorts of stories really stayed with me when I read them as a as a little boy. You know, the brave speech at the, from the scaffold, exactly as you say. And I think um, it's a shame not to really enjoy those scenes as a writer um, mm. for your readers, because I know they'll stick in readers' minds too. I guess one area, particularly in this book, The Six Wives of Henry VIII, that you possibly had to sidestep was the sex because yes, that's what yes. it's, well, there's a lot of no, that's a very good question yes exactly. it's a lot of the turning off of lights and people going to sleep <laughs> yeah blowing out candles <laughs> um, it's an interesting one because the two ob- obvious issues are sex and violence so when i wrote my book about the second world war there was a question mark about violence and with this one the question mark was about sex and we i talked about it quite a lot with my editors how much do you put in so the question mark, for example, one of the great questions of the sort of Henry VIII era is, did his brother Arthur, um, who, who married Catherine of Aragon mm. before he did, did, did they consummate the marriage? And people had, there were great arguments about this at the time. I sort of felt like that really wasn't an issue that a lot of parents would be happy with me going into for nine-year-old readers, or frankly, that the readers themselves would mm. would want to know about. And um I had a look at the sort of books that I had read as a child, so I've still got some of my old kind of Lady Bird books and R.J. Anstead-type books and things. And, of course, they don't go into these things, but they still manage to tell the story, so I thought it was it was still doable. But, yes, it doesn't really go beyond. There's a point with uh, Catherine Howard when she's a teenager. This is before she marries Henry VIII. And uh, and it's a really important for what comes later for her downfall that she and and, and her music teacher and, and various other characters have been kissing and tickling and carrying on after hours, and and absolutely in my story it doesn't go beyond kissing and tickling. Mm. I actually don't really think it's necessary for the story or that a child would appreciate it. I did think it was interesting. I think maybe you've really answered this question though. The six wives of Henry the Eighth, rather than. Henry VIII and his six wives. Um, yes. The nuance of that title is really reflected in the writing. That was something I thought about a lot. It was very, right from the start, I thought it, it, the wives are the, really the, the heroines, they're the characters. And Henry is the only person who's there from start to finish. Um, but I thought uh, this is not really a book about him. It's a book about them. And in particular, in the first part of the book, it's a book about Catherine of Aragon because I thought her story is immediately um, engaging to a child because so many children's stories begin with the journey. I mean, Harry Potter, you know, he goes off to Hogwarts. The Hobbit, Bilbo goes on his adventure. Um, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Lucy goes into Narnia. So I thought Catherine leaves her parents' home at the Alhambra in Granada uh, 
And she goes on this journey and she goes to England, this cold country, strange country. She doesn't speak the language. And I thought that will seem a familiar trajectory. And then once you, we are seeing it through her eyes, then we can bring in Anne Boleyn and we can bring in the other sort of the other wives. And it's more refreshing, I think, to see it through their eyes than to see it through sort of Henry's. Mm -hmm. And the political intrigue and power relationships. I yeah. mean, that's really the big theme, isn't it? That's right. It's the sort of the intrigue of it. I figured you could do this in a way that a child would find interesting. Just, you know, people whispering in the shadows, plotting, the sort of wheel of fortune turning. I, I reckon you can tell all that. Mm -hmm. And actually there, that sort of sense of mystery and of plotting and of uncertainty I always wanted to have a sense of un narrative uncertainty because every adult reader who reads about Henry VIII pretty much knows what's going to happen. And Anne Boleyn is going to have her head cut off eventually. Um, but, of course, very few of the children who read these books will know that, I would imagine. Mm. Um, and so I always liked having that sense of, you know, you don't know where the plotting is going to lead and the sort of the power dynamics and the labyrinthine sort of conspiracies and stuff. And to have that sense of uncertainty and of tension, mm -hmm. I thought was really important um, to sort of hook readers and to keep them reading. Mm. That's really interesting because I love the Wheel of Fortune. It's almost like a leitmotif, the musical theme that was going through. Um, and sometimes it turned quite quickly. It was remarkable how, you know, within a space of a few days, you could be uh, from the top to the bottom. Yes, um, I did that on purpose. My son really liked so Anne Boleyn is the great example that she doesn't, she's oblivious and then everything comes crashing down. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't believe it when she went from kind of hero to zero in the course of a chapter. And I loved kind of surprising him with that kind of, um, that, that narrative turn. I also felt that the um, the political side of it, that was the big historical idea for me, introducing children to historical ideas, <laughs> I thought came through as well as story. Oh, that's good. It may sound a, a completely mad thing to say, but... I did quite a lot of reading and thinking about the politics and, of course, the religious politics, which is so important. So as people listening to this podcast will know, the reign of Henry VIII is incredibly important in English history because it's the break with Rome, the Reformation, England going it alone as a kind of Protestant country with seismic um, long-term consequences. In some ways, you could argue we still live with today. Mm. Now, how do you explain that to a child of like 10 who maybe isn't religious has no sense of even the Christian story. How can you explain that all this matters? And I really sort of wrestled with that uh, in a good way and thought, you know, what is the best way to integrate that story um, with the story of Henry and his wives and to have, you know, people being burned at the stake, these arguments about books, the sort of politics of Henry and the Pope. It's mm -hmm. finding the way to present it in an engaging and human way and saying, you know, there are people's lives at stake People's entire being is 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 wrapped up in these things. And um, you know, it's exciting. It's really exciting. And I think that's that to me is what history should be, is incredibly exciting. And so I sort of tried to pour all that into the into the writing. So in stories, there are beginnings and endings. And in history, there are none. Yes, the story never ends. So I was interested in that respect that you obviously do have to think about your starting point. Yes. And you've talked about Catherine of Aragon, but actually you chose to write a prologue to set yeah. it in the context of the Tudor period. So why was that an important beginning? There are two answers to that. Um, one of them is sort of quite banal and the other is is more, um, uh, I hesitate to say intellectual, but it's slightly more, more highbrow. So the banal reason is I thought it was great to start with the battle. So it's the Battle of Bosworth. It's the moment when Henry's father, Henry VII, claims the throne from Richard III. And so I thought, you know, this is a good, a, a, an explosive kind of beginning. The other reason, the more highbrow reason, was I sort of felt like it was really important to, from a historical point of view or historiographical point of view, to get a, across the sense of, of, of insecurity that underlies this whole period. So basically, all of Henry's motivations under, have to be understood in the context of his kind of fear and insecurity. His father won the crown by force at Bosworth. And if he doesn't have a son, then it will all have been for nothing because his, the dynasty, the family, all that, all that he and his father worked for will be swept away. So I thought if I get that in their minds from the very beginning, then some of his decisions, which otherwise are just like the mad, capricious decisions of a monster, 
they become more explicable. You understand why he's so insecure, why he thinks he has to kill people. Because his thinking basically is if I don't kill them, the lesson of history is if I don't kill them, I will be killed. And I think to some extent he was probably right. Really interesting. Um, You've told us a little bit um, about the other books. We won't have time to talk about all four of them in the same depth, but the Second World War is a much broader landscape. And you've told us a bit about the stories that feature in that. Alexander the Great, are we going to see that mainly through his perspective? Yes, Alexander is the main character. Again, with Alexander, there's a slightly, there's there's an interesting trajectory. There's a slight sense of hubris with Alexander. He keeps going. He becomes obsessive. His his men end up... um, slightly mutinying and when he gets to India they want to go back um, and there's a slight sense of question mark is he almost kind of gone a bit mad so certainly at the beginning we're very much in his head he's a boy um, he tames his horse uh, he's you know has his first taste of battle he worships the gods all these kinds of things we see the Greek world through his eyes but as time goes on I slightly move the, the sort of narrative viewpoint away from him because there's a point at which I think the reader is quite maybe questioning Alexander's decisions. But yes, we're largely with him because, again, because I didn't want to make anything up. It's not like I could kind of invent a, 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 an ordinary Macedonian soldier and see it through his eyes. I, was, I didn't want to do that. The story there is a very, it's a journey. It's an adventure. So I was thinking a lot about the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit when I was mm-hmm. writing that. You know, they're traveling, they're going across these amazing landscapes across Persia and what's now Afghanistan and into India and Egypt and so on. I sort of had in mind, you know, the cameras kind of swooping over them as they travel and then they meet people and they have battles and they have adventures and so on. So that's obviously quite different from the Second World War one, which is more, you know, the, the frame is sort of colossal. And we're zeroing in on individual people and their experiences of the, of the conflict. That's interesting, giving a different treatment as the story requires it, really. Yes, it's exactly. Interesting to you talking about it, relating it to kind of big, epic uh, children's books and films there. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk, because a lot of our listeners are, are teachers or librarians, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, learning and, and studying history. And it seems to me that, history is often weaponized and it becomes a justification for revenge, a justification for war. So I want to know from your point of view, whether you think history has more positive applications or should we just leave the past in the past? So this is a really interesting question. I mean, I do a podcast series with my friend Tom Holland called The Rest is History. And we had a whole episode called The Lessons of History. And we took a pretty what some people might consider to be quite a sort of bleak conclusion. I mean, I don't really feel that there are lessons because I tend to think what happens with history is that people look at history and they learn the lesson that they wanted to learn. So in other words, they see their own principles reflected in the past. I think a lot of people do use history for sort of what we would consider quite unhealthy political purposes. There's a sort of fallacy, I think, often put about by historians like me, that the more history you know, the better you are as a person. But actually, some pretty terrible people have been very interested in history. Mm. And um, people historically, historically, sorry, it's a bit of a pun, people have often used history as a justification for, you know, wars, crimes, and so on. Um, That doesn't mean that I think is a bad thing to study it. Of course not. Um, and I think you can, that Six Wives of Him of the Eighth probably doesn't have lessons. The Second World War book, I was struck when I was writing it. I mean, one of the aspects, one, as it were, lesson is the, the courage of very ordinary people tested in by appalling sort of trials who sometimes find something in themselves they didn't know they had and are determined to stand up to, you know, wickedness or bullying um, on, a, on a colossal scale. So I suppose you can see that in history. But in terms of, I mean, if I'm re- going to be really basic about it, as a historian, as somebody who's thought and, and probably written about history, you know, almost every, certainly every working day of my life, um, to me, the key thing about history is simply that it is interesting and that it is fun. And it's a, it's a human, it's, it's part of human nature to think about our predecessors and to be curious about those who trod this earth before us or lived in the same house or, you know, who gave us our language and all these kinds of things. It would be, it would be inhuman not to be interested. And 
we don't, I think, need to create a great political purpose for it. I mean, to, for children, for example, they are always curious. And the justification for teaching children history and exposing them to it is just that it is unbelievably fascinating and enjoyable. And you, your life will be better <laughs> the more history you, you know, because it's fun. So, so I actually don't, perhaps quite unusually for a historian, I, I, I don't really think it has a great political, an, an inbuilt political benefit. Um, I think it's just the, I think the story, the characters, the sense of another world, and also actually something that you probably have talked about a lot on your podcast, because it's true with all great children's books or books generally, the, the feeling of being taken out of yourself, mm-hmm. out of your, the prison of your own consciousness and introduced other people and other worlds and other times. I think that's really important. Children, we know, love that. Mm. So one of the key things that you said there for me is other people, other worlds, other times. It must surely be important that we introduce children then to stories that are told from other people, other worlds, because history is about perspective. So it must be really crucial that we think of broader histories other than just what has traditionally been British history. I think that's true. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, Alexander the Great isn't British history. True. Um, (laughs) You know, Cleopatra isn't British history. This is true. So, um, you know, ancient Egypt, I did ancient Egypt at school in the 1970s. So I think people, it's a, I think people have always done extra British sort of international history, as it were. I think there's a balance, actually, it makes sense to start. I mean, every country on earth, by the way, every single sort of country on earth, developed or, or, or less developed, um, studies their own history primarily. They will study their own national story because they have a sense of their own community. I think that is obviously really important. You want to give people a sense of belonging to a kind of family, a family larger than themselves. But at the same time, you want to give them a sense of a wider world and of seeing things from different perspectives. So actually, I don't think... In, People need to, to super get super stressed about that. I think it's actually quite simple to do. You just keep, you know, you change every now and again. You give them a balance. You see it from different perspectives. I mean, one of the story, the one of the books I'll be doing in the future is the Conquest of the Americas, and there, you know, you might once have told that fifty or hundred years ago purely from the perspective of the Spanish sailing across the sea to the, the lands of the Aztecs and the Incas, and of course that is a great story, and, and it, you'd be mad not to tell it from that point of view. But these days, obviously, you also tell it from the point of view of the Aztecs and the Incas themselves, their societies. You know, you're not just going to paint them as kind of purely the objects of, of conquest or as the antagonists. You're going to see the Spanish through their eyes, give a sense of their world. Um, and, and that's, I think, just common sense. That's, that's what readers would expect these days. And it would just seem rational and natural to tell it that way. It's interesting. You talked about the Ladybird books earlier there was one about Walter Raleigh I don't know if you yeah. remember that but that Ladybird book has changed over successive versions including the illustration well yeah. that doesn't surprise I mean of course those books were written in the post-war years and they're, they're products of their time I mean R.J. Unstead's books that we were talking about earlier are also the products of their time just as my own books you know in a hundred years time or something mm-hmm. if if anybody cares about them Somebody would say, well, he's obviously writing from the perspective of 2021. Well, of course. I mean, that's human. That's, that's just how it is. Mm. So, um, perspectives change. Your viewpoint changes. The questions we ask about, if they didn't change, then nobody would write new history books because it would have been done. Yeah. That, that's what's so great about history is that you, your, where you stand to view it is always going to be different from the, the next person. The stories that can be told about the past actually are kind of infinite. Yeah. Again, I find that really interesting because the R.J. Unstead that we've mentioned a few times here, I read aloud from that the other day in uh, my session as well, the section on the cave cavemen, because the book is called From Cavemen to Vikings. And it talked about uh, the caveman's wife and how the caveman's wife scraped the skins and cooked the food but I didn't even know they got married I mean I don't think there's any evidence that they right. had yeah. wedding ceremonies but one of the things that I was saying is don't throw that book away because actually reading that book alongside the book that you've got now that somebody's written now that in itself is an interesting yes it is historical investigation yeah and certainly as I think as a historian my view would be the idea that we're right and our predecessors are wrong that you know our versions of, of the past mm. are, are better 
they're not better. They're just ours. I, I, I personally have, have no time for this sort of slightly looking down your nose mm. at the, the narratives that were told 50 or 100 years ago. I and mean, of course, they were of their time, but just as we are as our, of ours and our successors will no doubt have lots of, you know, rude things to say about us and, and probably quite rightly. Mm. that's a really good note to end on with thinking about people are going to be rude about us in the future (laughs) do you know it's just been such a pleasure talking to you today really thank you so much for your time oh no the pleasure's all mine i honestly i really enjoyed it in the reading corner is presented by nikki gamble and produced by alison hughes if you have enjoyed this podcast please do leave a review for us To find out about other projects, including an audience with events and the Exploring Children's Literature Summer School, visit www.exploringchildrensliterature.uk. Join us again soon in the Reading Corner on your favourite podcast platform.